Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. I don't even care that you guys hate my sports betting weeks on the show. <laughs> I need to do something different. We got a few more of these. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll get back to fantasy eventually. Just uh, hang tough, everybody. Hang tough, and maybe you guys will make a little money with us. I think this stuff is interesting, too, because... It also informs certain fantasy decisions, specifically things like, okay, do you think a particular team is tanking? Where do you go? You know, you move a player up or down in the ranks based on where you think they're going to be at the end of the year. But yes, ultimately, this is Sports Betting Week on Fantasy NBA Today. I am your host, Dan Vespris. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Those of you that stick with us here, we'll be back in fantasy, I think, on Tuesday of next week. Again... Don't panic. This isn't forever. Because, honestly, I wouldn't want to do it forever. But it's just nice to take a little detour every once in a while. I am at Dan Bespris on Twitter, should you feel so inclined to get a Twitter account and follow. D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. Sportsethos.com is the website. Go get yourself a fantasy pass. I have been informed now that... The NBA iteration of the Fantasy Pass will be released within the next 12 days. So that's pretty damn cool. Also, on top of the NFL side, which already exists for the first time ever, we got football. Follow JP, follow Joe over on the baseball side. That's all uh, free stuff now. That's podcast mostly. Joe also does an article. The continued growth of sports ethos has been one of my things that makes me the happiest because I've been... Uh, really involved in a lot of the stuff that's happened this offseason. So if you want to join us here at Sports Ethos, cover a team, whatever it might be. I know we're we're very much hunting DFS minds right now. Shoot me a note on Twitter at Dan Vespris or email roster at sportsethos.com. We head to the Southwest Division here on this uh, glorious and warm Wednesday morning in mid-August. It's been a pretty good, it's been a heater Across the U.S., I can't complain too much because a heater in uh, West L.A. is still only like 80 every day. Um, but it we're not used to it. We're not used to it. And I know everybody else is getting hit a little bit harder. I think my problem is that it doesn't really cool off that much overnight. Ah, well. Again, complain, complain, complain. It's only 77 at the time I'm recording this podcast, so it's really just not that bad. I just want, like, those low 80s days, they really kind of add up after a while. This is so dumb because I lived in Bakersfield. Don't talk to me about how, like, Dan, that's not hot. I know it's not hot. Do you guys know Bakersfield? Bakersfield is uh, like Texas heat, I've been told. I've never actually been to Texas. A little bit lower humidity. A little bit higher temper, uh, actual number on the thermometer. It's it's brutal out there. So this is nothing, which I guess is why I only complain on a podcast. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about the Southwest Division. We'll start with the team with the highest win totals. We'll work our way down the board. Same thing we've done the last few days. Uh, the Memphis Grizzlies are the team in the Southwest with the highest win total. It's 48 and a half. They're actually in a deadlock currently with the Mavericks at 48 and a half. And while it pains me to do it, I lean under on Memphis. I know this seems kind of insane because they're coming off a 56-win season last year. 56 and 26, including one of the best records at home in the entire NBA at 30 and 11. Actually had one of the best, I should clarify, they had one of the best road records also in the NBA. Second best road record in the league behind just the Suns. Grizzlies won 26 road games. Oddly, the Nuggets at 25 had the third best road record in the NBA. Excuse me, 76ers, 27 wins on the road. So they were uh, just in front. Just in front. I didn't even look at the Sixers after the year they had the previous season. So the Grizzlies had the third best road record in the NBA. It contributed to the fact that they did have the second best record overall in the NBA. 56 wins was second to the Suns. Eight games back, but still ahead of anybody in the Eastern Conference. Best record in the East was 53 wins. That was tied for the Warriors third in the West. But here's the thing about the Grizz. We can go into a whole bunch of personnel stuff, which to me does not favor continued improvement. 
JJJ had a big procedure done this offseason. He's not expected back for opening week. Um, we know with him there was the meniscus thing that was supposed to be two months, and then it was half a year. Uh, so I'm not going to expect him back quickly. And Kyle Anderson is elsewhere, and they traded DeAnthony Melton. That stuff is all well and good, and it doesn't. It certainly does lend itself to the under direction. But I think you can also, as kind of part of the same discussion, just note that, like, look, John Morant's going to keep getting better. Desmond Bain's going to get better. Brandon Clark's probably going to keep getting better. Dylan Brooks is going to get better. Even younger guys are going to keep getting better. The Grizzlies have plenty of guys that should take small or large or medium steps forward to cover up for most of that veteran presence loss. What I don't like about the Grizzlies this coming season is... Part of what I loved about watching them this last year. Now, again, look, don't don't let me try to fool you into thinking that I knew the Grizzlies were going to have a good year. They were actually an underbet for me last season that whiffed, or an under lean, I guess, on this board. It was not a it was not a top play, as I recall. But regardless, it was an under lean when I did the thirty teams article, which all of this stuff, by the way, will be in a thirty team article that I'll put up on the Sports Ethos website. So I misfired on the Grizzlies last year, but what I didn't know, or I don't know that anybody could really expect that they were going to do, was they they kind of went to that full, like, uh, LMU college offense from, what was that? When, when, what year was that? With Hank Gathers and the other LMU Lions. Uh, was that in the, like, the mid mid to late 80s? Was that 30 years ago? Early 90s? I can't remember exactly when that was. I was I was very little. I think it was the late 80s. No? Maybe even 1990. Bo Kimball, Paul Westhead, all that stuff. The Grizzlies basically reminded me of the the crazy LMU uh way of playing from the late 80s, early 90s. In that they just came in waves. They came in waves of guys just going full bore all the time in a way that we're just not accustomed to seeing teams play in the NBA over an 82-game season. The reason that LMU could do it at the college level, because, you know, they're playing two games a week for the most part. So the guys, like, if they're gassed, they got plenty of time to recover. Also, they're super young. But I, look, I don't want to take anything away from LMU. The And the Grizzlies didn't go as insane as LMU did. I think it's really just more of a theme. It's a theme. The Grizzlies didn't run their guys the most minutes in the NBA, far from it, because they had 10, 11 guys they were using every night. Just rolling them out there. Desmond Bain didn't average 30 minutes. One player on the Grizzlies averaged 30 minutes a game or more last year. Obviously, it was John Moran, and he was only at 33 like, we're talking about, th- this is actually a, a critically important note. If you sort the NBA by minutes per game, you don't get to a Memphis Grizzly player until you get to John Morant, who's effectively like the 50th, might even be farther down the board than that. It- it's in the 50s in terms of minutes per game. No one on the Grizzlies played minutes in the NBA inside the top 50. Does Jaw see a few extra minutes per game this year, get from 33 to 34 or 35? I don't know. Maybe Desmond Bain, does he officially get up and over 30 minutes this coming season? Yeah, probably. So this sort of goofball stat with an arbitrary cutoff line is less interesting. And Dylan Brooks probably plays close to 30 minutes a game. He had a lot of injury, return from injury games that artificially depressed his total. But look, even JJJ, who had a great season, number 37 per game, played in 78 out of 82 games last year, dude played 27 and a half minutes per game. And the Grizzlies just kept coming at you. The other side of this same discussion on Memphis is while they only had one player who actually played more than 30 minutes per game, if you want to count up the guys in the Grizzlies that played basically 19 minutes or more, because I want to get Brandon Clark in the discussion as well, it was... Desmond Bain, JJJ, John Morant, DeAnthony Melton, Dylan Brooks, Brandon Clark, Stephen Adams, Kyle Anderson, Tyus Jones, Zaire Williams. 
10 players on the Grizzlies average 19 and a half minutes or higher last year. This is part of what made them a really good regular season team. Reminds me of the Knicks, which is kind of a different one. They played their starters like 42 minutes a night, but, you know, that's the Thibodeau method. Uh, of teams that just go harder than everybody else during the regular season and win games simply because they're trying more. What's happening, everybody? Dan here. I am so excited to tell you about what is arguably the coolest partnership we've ever had here on Fantasy NBA Today, and that is with the good folks over at Trend Him. Trend Him. It was founded back in 07 and has high-quality and affordable accessories for men. Basically, everything you could wear other than the clothes. When I'm Like, my mind is blown right now. I got a personalized watch with a picture of my two kids on the inside. And obviously, the watch is super sleek, but having my kids on the inside is amazing. I was able to get a few belts. I replaced my wallet. I got some ties. This is... So cool. I was so excited to roll down to the UPS store and pick up the package that the guy that was running the store was like out getting a sandwich and I just sat out front for 10 minutes. Check them out again. Trend him is the company. Trend him. They personalize, as I just mentioned to you. The prices are great. Amazing value for your money. Amazing value. And over 6,500 different products in 22 different categories you can check out the link in the show description that's probably the easiest way to find them or go to trnd.hm so trend him but take out the vowels trnd.hm slash hoopball it's our old website name trnd.hm slash hoopball and get 15% off your order. Again, you can just go to the uh, URL in the in the show description. That easy to find on whatever service you're using to listen to today's show. Or go to trnd.hm slash hoopball. Get 15% off your order. And check out some of the amazing stuff they've got over there. You're going to love it, I assure you. When it comes to the big game, every second counts. Especially if you're missing even a moment of the action to go on a drink run. And if you're like me, you don't want to go out anyway. Maybe it's a big game you're missing. Maybe it's just, I don't really want to change out of pajama pants. Luckily, there's Drizzly, the number one app for alcohol delivery. With Drizzly, you can shop local stores and compare prices on the biggest selection of beer, wine, and spirits. And you know you've been consuming them over the last couple of years. And the best part, You can get them delivered in under 60 minutes or schedule them two weeks out. Talk about a slam dunk. Ah, see what I did there? Drizzly also makes it easy to send the gift of alcohol right to your friends and family for any occasion. Even if that occasion is rubbing it in their face when their team loses. Ah, you know me. I'm a pragmatic sort. We'll we'll order it when it's winning time. In your face, other team. Nah. In our face. Drinks. So if you're looking to spend more time watching the game, download the Drizzly app. That's the easiest way. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Do it now. The reason I'm fading the Grizzlies this coming year is because I don't think they're going to have that energy or that advantage this season the way they did this last year. First of all, if JJJ misses any time, you lose your defensive anchor. DeAnthony Melton is gone. He was an amazing defensive player on the perimeter. Yes, they've still got plenty of guys on that team that can play defense, but a thinning of the herd on the Grizzlies is actually not a good thing for their win total. In the way that some teams sort of addition by subtraction comes into play, I think it's quite the opposite. With Memphis, it's always subtraction by subtraction. If you lose players that had a big role or a medium role, you can try to replace them and do the same stuff with different bodies, and maybe it'll work a little bit. But look, the league knows what you're doing now. The book is out. Memphis is not going to be able to play that way. Plus, I think they want to try to keep John Morant healthy. So try to lock him down from getting, you know, 75 feet in the air when he's jumping. Anything to keep him ready for those playoff runs. Anything to keep the, the most important guys ready for those playoff runs, as they hopefully 
take a step forward individually, but I don't think they're winning 56 games again. I think there's a reason this number is well below where they were last season, and I'll roll with it and take the under. For similar but opposite reasons, I like the Mavericks to squeak over their total because, yes, they did lose Jalen Brunson, but they added Christian Wood, who was a, a total sourpuss in Houston last year. He just he signed up with a really bad team, knowing they were going to be a pretty bad... Well, actually, I mean, I guess James Harden was still on that club. And so Wood that kind of dealt a, a, a weird hand, and, and now he's gotten a reputation as being a, a butthead in the clubhouse. I think he's going to be a lot better with Dallas. Defensively, he'll have to step it up a little bit. I think he can. He certainly has the athletic ability to do so. Um, but here's the thing. A lot of this handicap, you can go into all these little details and, and that maybe makes you sound smarter. Um, uh, cause at least it looks like, you know, a bunch of things about a team and you guys know, I know plenty of things about plenty of teams. I don't have to prove anything to podcast listeners. You can either think I'm dumb. You can think I'm smart. It doesn't really matter when you're handicapping individual games, season win totals, whatever it might, whatever it might be. You're not looking for. 15, 16 different things that all point in the same direction. You're looking for wherever you believe there's an edge. And to me, this year, the Mavericks edge... Now, last year, we loved the Mavericks over. That was one of the big bets because they were coming off uh, a a season where they just got brutalized by COVID. Remember, they lost a bunch of players in Denver that just, like, couldn't rejoin the team for three weeks. And so then everybody else got gassed and they all got hurt. They couldn't have been any worse. And so that was an easy one. This number's a lot closer. Mavs are probably around a 50-win team this year. But it's going to come down to Luka Doncic being in shape. I don't normally put much stock in the guy is in shape off-season videos. A lot of, like, muscle watch stuff. Luka doesn't need muscle watch. Luka needs, uh, like, thickness watch. He's come into multiple seasons just not in game shape. And it sets the Mavericks back in a way that they've been uh, they've been able to easily overcome because of how unbelievably good he is. And then last year with the games that he missed, Jalen Brunson filled in admirably. The Mavericks were still pretty good even when Luka was out. And so now, yeah, they lost their safety net. With Brunson going, they still have Spencer Dinwiddie, but he's not the same kind of guy. Brunson was a high efficiency player in a way that Dinwiddie just isn't. They did get Luka a better running partner in Christian Wood. He makes more sense, I think, than Kristaps Porzingis did just for what kind of that team is. I see Christian Wood as being a little bit more aggressive. Porzingis has... There's a little bit of fear to his game, and I think maybe it's just because he gets hurt all the time. And Wood's not exactly a pillar of health, but I think we can probably call him fearless on this team. But again, it's not about that. It's not about Christian Wood or Dwight Powell or Spencer Dinwiddie or Dorian Finney-Smith, who's actually a perfect fit next to Luka Doncic. It's about whether Luka comes into this season in shape Because in shape, Luka shoots 46 to 48% from the field and high 70s at the free throw line. And sorry for this expression, Chubb Luka doesn't. Chubby Luka doesn't shoot as well from the field or the free throw line because he's freaking tired when he's out there. He's shooting 71, 72% at the line. He's shooting 43, 44% from the field. And that adds up to wins and losses and to Luka's fantasy value. They should have Tim Hardaway Jr. back this year, so that adds a little bit of scoring punch that hopefully replaces some of what Jalen Brunson took with him. Again, not on the efficiency side, but they'll find ways to make up for that. Just because Luka has so much gravity, he's going to find guys that are open, and if he doesn't, he's going to do stuff himself. If Luka, who played 65 games last year, by the way, if Luka can get to 68 games this season, the Mavs will get to 50 wins, and this one will go slightly over the total. I struggled with the next one. The Pelicans number was 44 and a half, and I went under with it. Um, I do think they're a lot better this year. So that's that's the problem here. The Pelicans won 36 games last season, slipped into the play-in, and then actually made the playoffs in it. 
because they got better. The C.J. McCollum trade made them a lot better. The emergence of Herb Jones and Jose Alvarado made them a little bit better. Brandon Ingram playing much better towards the end of the season obviously improved them. Jonas Valanciunas has been a nice grab for New Orleans. And now we're contending with Zion. That's the big thing. Zion supposedly back, so the Pelicans' number is big compared to where it was last season. Do they get kind of what the Timberwolves bounce? Or is it a more moderate gain? My bet is on the Pelicans making moderate gains this year. I like them a lot more than last season. But a lot to me could still be five to eight wins as opposed to what they need to get to their number, which is nine or more. Nine is a big big jump when you're already hovering near the 500 mark. Nine is not that hard when you're the Rockets and you won 20 games. Getting to 29 wins doesn't take that much. You just start beating some of the other bad teams every once in a while. Pelicans are going to be, I feel pretty confident in saying, an extremely unpredictable, highly energetic, and super fun offensive team that's going to really have issues defending people because they got weird bodies all over the place some of whom play defense, Jones and Alvarado, many of whom don't. Some we don't even really know whether they play defense or not. Like, are we expecting Zion to be a pillar on defense? I don't know. We can see him, we've seen him fly in college, but that stuff hasn't really translated to the NBA. Valanciunas isn't a great defender. He's a good rebounder, but not a great defender. McCollum is not exactly known for his defense. Ingram has arms that stretch across my entire L.A. apartment but he isn't really known for his defense either. They're all okay, but they've never really put it together as a unit, and having Herb Jones slot him in there somewhere, that doesn't just fix the team's defense, even if individually he's quite good. When you get a team like that, that's built so heavily on offensive firepower, you get the Hawks, basically. Now, the Hawks are more reliant on one individual player getting everybody a ton of offense. The Pelicans will have more ways to do it, but also the Pels, I believe, are in a conference that's a little more top-heavy. Maybe that's the wrong word for it. The West is going to have probably 13 teams, eh, 12, that are all going to be fighting to get to the 500 mark. The East, you might argue that there could be 14 teams that are all fighting for, like, 37 or 34 wins. I don't know. It's just sort of a different beast. You know, you've got a 64-win Suns team. You had three teams in the West that had better records than the top teams in the East, basically. The East is caught up. It's not as lopsided as it used to be, but it's a gauntlet out there. So, yeah, Pelicans are going to win a few more games that maybe they shouldn't have won, and they're going to lose a few games they shouldn't have lost because they're going to be a bit inconsistent. They're going to be better. But Pell's at 44 wins feels like a good jump to me and one that I don't know that they can get past. They're going to have, this is weird to say too, they're going to have a little bit of a target on them just because of the Zion stuff. They're not an underdog, even though they are technically an underdog. They'll be fun though. I'll want to watch some Pell's games, even if I don't think they're going to win 45 of them. Thinking a team's going to win 44 games, it's weird to do... uh, to say to talk about all the reasons to bet an under on a team that you like, but yep, that's where you are. And now you've got two tankos at the bottom. I'm clumping them together on today's podcast because <sighs> this is hard to do also. If you listen to yesterday's show, you heard my synopsis of the Oklahoma City Thunder, who I took under 26 and a half wins because they should tank. By that token you'd assume that then I'm going to go under on any team that I think is in tank mode this year. And it's actually just sort of not the case. The Spurs and the Rockets, and if you get, we got over to the Eastern Conference at some point, teams like the Pistons, Pacers, especially if they trade away a couple remaining veterans, maybe the Magic, it's less clear because they did just get the number one. But certainly the other four or five teams I just mentioned, it's pretty obvious what they're going to be trying to do this year. Get Victor Wembanyama. How bad are you willing to be to get to that point? 
This last season, the three worst records in the NBA belonged to the Rockets, 20 wins, the Magic, 22, and the Pistons at 23 wins. The Thunder were actually not in the bottom three, but still scored the number two pick in the draft because, look, it's all lotto balls. You get a slightly better chance by being one of the bottom three teams, but it certainly doesn't guarantee you the best three picks. Yes, the Magic got the top slot. Uh, or were the Rockets two? I already forget. No, Rockets were three. They got they got Smith at three. So the Rockets had the worst record in the league. They got the third pick. Magic had the second worst record. They got the one. Pistons ended up at four. They still ended up getting some pretty... Oh, wait, five. Did they fall behind the Kings? Yeah, they fell behind the Kings, didn't they? Uh, Pistons ended up with some pretty decent stuff in the draft, even though they kind of got the unlucky ping pong balls this last year. None of what we saw this last season is, there's the short version, going to dissuade any teams from trying to tank. Because, look, one of the bottom three teams did get the top pick in the draft. That's kind of the way that they designed it. But, on the other hand, and look, with the Spurs, the handicap is obvious. They traded away DeJounte Murray, so they're going into a tank. For the Rockets, the handicap is obvious. They're still not very good. They traded away Christian Wood, um, mostly because he was actually probably making players on the team worse by just not being happy there. And if you look out east, whatever, no, we'll, we'll just talk about the Spurs and Rockets for now. The, the handicap is easy. They're going to lose games. when Banyama is a, a franchise changer, so teams are going to try to be at the bottom. My argument for both leans to the over here is that I don't think the worst three teams in the NBA combine this coming season for only 65 wins. I think that number is about four or five wins higher combined between the three teams. I think there's a very real chance that if the Pacers trade Miles Turner and Buddy Heald, they have the worst record in the NBA this season. I think in Indiana could be that team. Right now, their number is just one higher than Houston and San Antonio, and that's because they still have Turner and Heald on the roster. But you dump those guys, that team is crazy young. Halliburton's not going to be able to carry them to much more than just a, a terrible season. I li Again, you like some young guys there. Uh, as far as the Rockets go, I just don't know how they could possibly be any worse. And I think that all the losing did kind of get to the players and the franchise. And that's something that they'll probably want to fix this coming year. And frankly, I think it's something that will kind of fix itself. Christian Wood is addition by subtraction. Alperen Sengun is addition by getting him into the lineup. Jabari Smith Jr., that's a really nice add. Early in the draft, he's going to make an immediate impact as a young guy. Jalen Green was starting to figure things out at the end of his rookie season. I clown on him all the time, but Kevin Porter Jr. was actually pretty good. At the end of last season. I know the Rockets still only went 2-8 and eight over their final 10 games. And they lost their last 7. Uh, but you saw these little, little sprinklings of a team that is going to go from getting blown out every night to being competitive some of the time. And when you're competitive some of the time, you win 23 or 24 games instead of 20. It's as simple as that. For the Spurs, they still have enough left in San Antonio to accidentally win 23 or 24 ball games. So all of that to say that this number being 23 and a half, it's not exactly an inspiring way to lean to an over when you think they might get to 24. I just don't think teams are going to be chasing each other down to 20 this coming season. I think you might see maybe the Pacers, if again, if they unload everybody, they might just be hanging out in that 20 to 22 range. But I think you're going to see the Pistons, the Magic, the Spurs, the Rockets, probably those four. Maybe we can add another team into the mix at some point down the line. There's some, some questionables. Those teams are probably all going to be pacing out to about 24 or 25 wins. And you might see one or two of them just tank a little better. Thunder. That's another one I should have thrown in there. The Thunder. Remember, the Thunder got to 24 wins last year, and they got, presumably, a tiny bit better. So even if they just replicate, that would be an under for OKC, but it would be an over for these other teams. I think you're just going to see a bunch of teams right around 24 or 25 
this season, and maybe the one that goes way underneath it and just guarantees that worst record in the league. But I think you're going to see a lot of teams in the 24 range because, look, 2022, those are awful. Even getting to 23, 24, 25, it does feel a little different. And maybe you'll even get some teams wiggling up towards 26, heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. Blazers got to 27 last year somehow. Lost their last 11 games in a row. It is, and this is the thing, like, it's hard to do what the Suns did last year. It's really hard to only lose 18 games. It's also really hard to only win 20. Just have a good shooting night every once in a while. Play another bad team and beat them. I know, gas, but the Rockets pretty much didn't beat anybody. It's it's small, but it's also large at the same time. And so while I think both of these teams, the Rockets and the Spurs, will be quite bad, and they're going to want that top pick, they just have a little bit too much on the roster and a little too much pride, honestly, especially with the Rockets, because they've, they've now they've been tanking for a bit here. Uh... It's time to just put the guys in, let them roll. Shengun, Green, bunch of juniors. They got Jay Sean Tate. They got Kenyon Martin, Jr., KJ. A lot of juniors on that Rockets team. They're okay. They're not as god-awful as they were this last season. Spurs, same thing. They're going to be terrible, but they're not going to be god-awful. So leans to the over on both, although, I again, I'd argue for it for six, seven minutes here. I don't know that I would bet it. And frankly, I don't like too many of the wagers in this Southwest division. The Grizzlies under 48.5 is probably the one I like the most out of those five, but compared to uh, what we went through in the Pacific and Northwest, where there were a bunch of things that I thought were really interesting plays there, yeah, not... Not not super thrilled about those. I still think the Kings might be my favorite play we've discussed so far. I know. What? What? All right. On to the Eastern Conference tomorrow we shall go. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Dan Vespers for Fantasy NBA Today. Uh, check me out with Josh Lloyd, fellow podcast extraordinaire. That's coming up later today. What the hell is today? Wednesday? We're recording that at 3 p.m. Pacific time. I don't know if that's going to be live or not. Great promo he did here by Dan, they say. Okay. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. So long, everybody.